title, Unquestioning Discipleship. And let me encourage you to take notes and at the margin to have highlights and make applications from the messages which you have heard and will be hearing tonight. Before Mr. Sanders comes up here to share the word with us, I'll ask Noah again. All good things come to an end. And we have arrived at the last meeting. May I say what a great joy it has been to me to be with you during these days and to have the privilege of presenting the Word of God, which I trust will take root in your heart. I trust it has been mixed with faith in those who heard it. And that in coming days, your lives will demonstrate in a very wonderful way what a true disciple can do in the hands of the Lord in being an instrument for changing lives. Our reading tonight is found in John's Gospel, chapter 21. John's Gospel, chapter 21. In the first part of the chapter, you remember that Peter said, I'm going fishing. And the other said, well, we're going too. And they went out and fished, but all, all, fished all night, but they caught nothing. And then Jesus came and told them to cast their net on the right side of the boat, and they would find some, and they did. Now, verse 9. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And then there follows that very poignant interview when our Lord asked Peter the threefold question and received the threefold response and then gave Peter his threefold commission. But will you read on now from verse 19, uh, verse 18. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked where you would. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go. This, he said, show, to show by what death he was to glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw following them the disciple whom Jesus loved. And of course that disciple was John, who had lain close to his breast at the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. The saying spread abroad among the brethren that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you?
When our Lord called Peter and Andrew to follow him in the path of discipleship, they were casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. And he said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You see, when he called them to discipleship, he indicated what one of the responsibilities of discipleship would be. I will make you fishers of men. And the word there carries the idea of taking alive. Taking men alive. That's the title of a book on soul winning. And this is part of the job of the disciple. The call didn't come to those men out of the blue. I think undoubtedly they had heard the Lord speak many times. They'd been attracted to him. They'd been attracted to his message. But now... He tells them, follow me. And immediately, immediately they left everything and followed him. That's tremendously significant. I don't know that that could be repeated in our society today as easily as it was there. Today we're living in a very complex society. But the Lord still tells us to follow him in discipleship and he still expects an immediate response and he deserves it as well as desires it these men were fishermen and our Lord spoke to them in terms of their own craft he indicated to them that the expertise they had gathered as a result of their work as fishermen could be lifted to a higher level and used for a higher purpose. He said, you've been fishing for fish. You've been taking fish alive. But if you'll follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Here the Lord promised and guaranteed his own personal tuition. He said, I will make you fishers of men. I'll enable those gifts and talents of yours which you have used to get fish. I'll enable you to use them to bring men into the kingdom. And I'm glad that he chose for this task ordinary men. The twelve disciples were ordinary men just like you and like me. And when I say man I mean woman too because men always embrace women don't they? I mean man, the, the word man embraces women. <laughs> but Jesus chose ordinary people. It's striking that he didn't chose, choose a single scholar. He didn't choose one influential person. He didn't choose one rich person. He didn't choose anyone with social status. At least at that st stage he didn't. He did later on. But when he was choosing the 12 men through whom he was going to change the world, he chose ordinary men like you and like me. I find that very comforting because as Abraham Lincoln said, God must love the common people very much because he made so many of them. And I think he does. And he wants us ordinary men and women to be so true, so faithful in our following him that he can use us in his service. It's interesting too that these men whom Jesus chose came from Galilee. They didn't come from Jerusalem. There's only one came from Jerusalem. That was Judas, Judas Iscariot. The others all came from Galilee. Now I think that's something that's very interesting in the context of Singapore. Why did Jesus choose people from Galilee? Galilee was called Galilee of the Nations. It was a very populous area. There, apparently there were over 200 towns there of more than 15,000 people. 
And it, it was a very cosmopolitan area. They came from different nations. The caravan routes went through there. And so the people who were in Galilee were used to mixing with people of other races. Anything like Singapore? Why? Here you've got a, a cosmopolitan community. And it's a fact that people who are used to mixing with other peoples, who've broken away from their own rigid culture, are more open to new ideas and more ready to follow new ideas than those who are held in the grip of their own culture. And so the Lord didn't choose people from Jerusalem where they were very, very rigid and in their views, but he chose people who were more used to mixing with others. And uh, I think this says something for Singapore. You've got, you're here at the crossroads of the world. People of every race are coming and going and you're used to mixing with them. And God gives you contacts with people that are quite unique because he wants you to be fishers of men in not only in this pool, not only in this sea, but also in the uttermost part of the earth. He also suggested to these men that their skills, the skills that they had learned through being fishermen, could be used in the art of fishing men. And you know, uh, a fisherman, uh, is, is fishing is a very skilled occupation. It requires endless patience. Uh, if you are an impatient person, you'll never make a good fisherman. They've got to wait for the fish to take the bait. It requires perseverance. You must never get discouraged or else you'll never make a good fisherman. Because sometimes you have to wait a long time before the fish takes the bait. A good fisherman never gets discouraged. The fisherman needs wisdom in selecting the bait he's going to use. When I used to go fishing with my uncle, he used to, the first fish he caught, he'd cut it open and see what kind, of, what the fish had been feeding on. And then he would use that kind of, uh, of, of uh, fly or whatever it was for bait that was in fly fishing. The fisherman has got to choose the right bait and so it is in soul winning you've got to be able to provide the right word a word in season at the right time it requires discrimination in timing if you pull your line too quickly you'll probably miss the fish so these these uh, things that were learned in fishing could be used in the art of winning souls. Now, in the passage we read together, it took place on the Sea of Tiberias. The time was the morning when Jesus cooked the breakfast. I like that idea. The morning when Jesus cooked the breakfast. Doesn't that bring him near to us? Here were his disciples. They'd been out all night. They'd had a disappointing time at first. They'd taken nothing. And then they got a huge haul. And they were sopping wet. And they were cold. And they were hungry. And when they came ashore, what did they find? They found a charcoal fire there. And fish cooking on it. And who was the cook? The Lord of glory. What an amazing thing. I think as the angels looked down and saw Jesus cooking the breakfast, they must have got a terrible shock. And yet how wonderful to think that he was so interested and so loving and so concerned about those disciples that he had breakfast ready for them. And he said, I've got some fish here. Now you give, bring some more of yours. You, I haven't got enough. You bring more. And so he put more fish on the fire to cook for their breakfast. A wonderful touch that brings our Lord very near to us. 
Now in times of testing, Christians in all ages are tempted to complain that, as in Ezekiel they said, the ways of the Lord are not equal. The ways of the Lord are just, aren't just. God really doesn't always treat us quite fairly. Have you ever had that feeling? You ever felt that the Lord has really let you down? Something you expected him to do and he hasn't done it? And you begin to complain? You mightn't say it in words, but in your heart you've got a secret resentment because the Lord didn't do exactly what you wanted him to do. I admit that some of God's dealings do seem to conflict with our sense of fairness. Some people seem to get preferential treatment. Some people seem to get all the breaks. Others seem to get all the trouble. I know families that if there's any trouble going, they're sure to be in it and right up to the neck. They just time after time, they seem to move from trouble to trouble. I know other families where everything seems to run smoothly. They have no problems with their families, with their children. They're not nicely settled financially and so on. And everything seems to be running smoothly. It's all sunshine. And it doesn't seem quite fair. The psalmist Asaph in Psalm 73 was looking round and he saw that the wicked were the people who seemed to prosper, not the righteous. Why, the, the wicked man, he flourishes like a green bay tree and the righteous man seems to have all the problems. And he said, my feet had well nigh slipped. I had almost lost my foothold. His faith had just about given way. He was thinking, what's the point? What's the point of being righteous if the wicked person gets all the breaks? He said, my... my Foothold, I almost lost my foothold until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I saw their end. Ah, that's the point. It's when we fail to go into the sanctuary of God with our problems that we uh, begin to complain. But if we go into the sanctuary of God and see things from God's viewpoint, it makes a difference. When Asaph saw things from God's viewpoint, he saw what the end was. You know, if this life were all there was, maybe uh, things are not very equal. But this life is not all there is. For the Christian, there is yet the, the wonderful future when everything will be made straight, the crooked will be made straight, when everything will be made just, when the Lord will put all things right. And Asaph said, when I saw their end, then why I regained my foothold. So even although it may seem as though the ways of the Lord are not just, they really are just. The Lord was speaking to Peter and Peter seemed to get into a lot of trouble, didn't he? He seemed always to be saying the wrong thing. And our Lord seemed to treat Peter more roughly than he did the other disciples. You think, for example, when uh, Jesus was telling Peter that he was going to be, men were going to take him and they were going to kill him and crucify him. And he'd rise again. And Peter said, Lord, God forbid, this shall not be unto you. Pity yourself, Lord. And how did Jesus respond to Peter's loving concern? All he said was, get thee behind me, Satan. Now that didn't seem a very... A nice way to reply when Peter was just concerned about the Lord. And Jesus didn't explain what he meant by it either. And on, on the, in another occasion, here when uh, 
Peter turned round and saw John after Jesus had told him by what kind of death he was going to glorify God. And Peter said, well, what about this man? Jesus said to him, in effect, Peter, mind your own business. Now, why, why did the Lord treat Peter like that? Was he picking on him? No, he wasn't. Peter was going to be the key man in the establishment of our Lord's kingdom. He was going to be the leader of the apostolic band. And he must learn his lessons thoroughly. And the Lord wanted to teach him one very important lesson. Jesus had just concluded that wonderfully tender interview with Peter. How wonderful it was. He didn't say to Peter, Peter, you've got to take further training to further equip yourself in my service. You won't be much use to me unless you do. Now I'm all for further training, but Jesus didn't say that to him. What did he say? He said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Oh, yes, Lord, I love you, Peter said. Peter, do you really love me? Oh, yes, Lord, I really love you. Peter, do you really love me? And Peter was grieved that he asked the third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Why did the Lord say it over three times? Peter had denied him three times. And he gave him three times the opportunity of expressing his love and his devotion. And you know, if our love for the Lord is right, our following of the Lord in discipleship will be close. If we follow him because we love him, he'll say to us, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, look after the little lambs. That's what he did with Peter. But the point he made with him was not, are you well qualified intellectually, but are you well qualified in your love for me? Do you really love me? Jesus knew that if his love was right, everything else would fall into its right place. And Peter asked an irrelevant question. Jesus told him the very unwelcome news that when he was old, he said, when you were young, you went where you wanted to go, but when you were old, Men are going to take hold of you and they're going to stretch out your hands and they're going to take you where you don't want to go. And he said this to show by what death he was going to glorify God. I don't think I'd feel very uh, excited about it if I was told by what death I was going to die. I'd sooner it was left uh, in the dark. But here Peter suddenly faced with this knowledge that I'm going to die and I'm, it's going to be a violent death. Other people are going to take me. It must have given him a tremendous shock. But you, you'd have thought, wouldn't you, that having just come from that wonderful interview where the Lord had recommissioned him, that his mind would be concentrating on the wonderful grace of God. How wonderful of the Lord that he's given me another chance. I thought I'd spoiled it all. I thought I was out of the apostolate. And he's given me another chance. You'd have thought that his mind would have been taken up with thoughts like that. Instead of that, dear old Peter caught a sight of John walking over here. And Peter's mind had a habit of going off at a tangent. And instead of thinking about what lay ahead of him and thinking about the love of the Lord, he sees John. Lord, what about this man? What's going to happen to him? 
Is he going to die like that too? Are people going to take him and stretch out his hands and take him where he doesn't want to go? What a strange way for Peter to react. But it was very human, wasn't it? Isn't it very easy for us to get our eyes on other people? When the Lord's dealing with us and tells us what he wants us to do, it's very easy for us to look over our shoulder and say, well, are other people going to get preferential treatment? Is John going to uh, have the same sufferings and death as I am going to have, Peter said? Am I being discriminated against, Lord? Will John receive preferential treatment? The Lord had to teach him a very strong lesson. You see, Peter was beginning to feel sorry for himself. I'm not being treated fairly. If John, is John going to escape the kind of things that I'll have to go through? And the Lord wouldn't allow any self-pity to come into Peter's mind. You see, he had already asserted his rights over Peter's future. And now when Peter asks that question, the Lord asserts his rights over John's future. He said, you leave John to me, Peter. That's not your business. If I will that John remains alive until I come, what's that to you? That's not your business. You see, what he was trying to do Peter was being trained in the school of discipleship for a supremely important task. And he must learn not to compare his lot with the lot of others. He must not look over his shoulder to see how other people are being treated. The Lord said, Peter, that's no concern of yours. You keep on following me. That's the tense of the verb. Follow me. Keep on following me. Your business is to keep your eyes on me and my dealings with you. I will look after John. I've got the same right over him as I have over you. The master deals with each one of us individually. He's, he's so interested in the individual. I was preaching in America at Mount Hermon Conference Center a good many years ago. And after I'd given one message, an old man came up to me and he said, uh, I hear you come from New Zealand. I said, yes, that's right. Oh, he said, I used to live in New Zealand. He said, I left there 50 years ago. And he started talking about New Zealand. I said, where did you live? He said, oh, I lived in Dunedin. I said, oh, I lived in Dunedin for a while too. Oh, you did, did you? And then he said, would you happen to remember a lawyer named John Wilkinson? This is 50 years ago, you see. I said, would I remember him? I used to work with him. He said, what, you work with John Wilkinson? I said, yes, indeed. And uh, we talked about him and about other people whom we knew in common. At the end of the conference, the old man came up to me and he said, uh, John Wilkinson had a son, didn't he? I said, yes. Is the son alive? Oh, no, I'm sorry, he's dead, I said. Oh, he said, I'm sorry. I said, why are you so sorry? And he hesitated for a moment. And then he said, when I left Dunedin 50 years ago, I owed John Wilkinson a sum of money which I've never paid. And he said, during this co conference, God has been reminding me of my sin. And he said, I thought that if his son were alive, I could refund the money to him. But if he's dead, well, there's nothing I can do. I said, oh, I wouldn't say that. I said, I, I would suggest this. That if you want really to put this thing right, you would work out what would be a right sum to refund, and then I'd give it to some branch of Christian work, and the Lord would know that you're 
wanting to put right a wrong. Well, that was the end of it, as I thought, but I was back at that same conference center about four years later. The old man came up to me and said, do you remember me? I said, yes, I remember you. Do you remember our conversation? Yes, I remember our conversation. He said, well, I did what you said. And he said, I gave the money to the OMF, the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. <laughs> That's the mission I belong to. I said, well, you couldn't have done better than that. <laughs> and he, he was so he was so thrilled he said you know it was such a relief to have a sin of 50 years off my conscience that I felt I must do something to show my gratitude to the Lord so he said I started a prayer group in my home and every we meet regularly and we pray for the OMF and other missions when he told me that I thought, how wonderful. 230 million people in America. Only one person on the American continent knew a man who lived in New Zealand 50 years ago. I happened to be that man. And God, in his concern to allow an old man to get right with him so arranged that we too should meet. One chance in 230 million. Is God interested in the individual? How wonderfully interested he is. God's interested in every individual and he deals with them individually. He deals with Peter one way. He deals with John another way. But he is the one who has control of their lives. No disciple has any business to concern himself with God's dealing with other people, even although he doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to be fair. Our business is to follow him. Keep on following him without deviation. Peter, that was Peter's sole concern, to discharge his own responsibility. And what happened in the end? How did Peter die? Eusebius, one of the early church fathers, tells us. It says, he says, he was crucified head downwards, for so he himself asked to suffer. Peter didn't think he was worthy to be crucified the same way as his Lord. So when they were going to crucify him, he asked that they would crucify him upside down. Ah oh yes, what the Lord said was true, but before Peter was crucified, what a wonderful testimony, what a wonderful life of service he left behind him. He learned his lesson. He didn't look at other people. He was prepared to pay the price himself. And what of John? What happened to John? Well, you remember that John and James and John had uh, asked the Lord for first and second place in the kingdom. And the Lord said, you don't know what you're asking. He said, are you able to uh, drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism wherewith I am baptized? And they said, oh yes, we're able. And Jesus said, I think very sadly, he said, yes, you will drink the cup that I drink. You will be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. And they were. James was in prison and he had his head cut off. Peter, in the end, was crucified upside down. John finished his days in a concentration camp. Yes, they suffered. They went through persecution. And our Lord's prediction was true. 
that the Lord's dealing with Peter was to impart something to his character that would change him from being a pebble into a rock. Peter was a volatile, fickle kind of man to start with. But the Lord worked strongly on him and turned him into a rock. When I was a young man, I worked for eight years under Reverend Joseph Kemp in Auckland. Uh, incidentally, I married his daughter many years afterwards. But uh, he was a very strong man. He was a man, a great preacher. He uh, built a church in Edinburgh. And uh, this was in the early part of the century. And he had a revival there that went on for two years, every night of the week, and not a night there wasn't a service. The first year there were a thousand converted. The second year there were 800 converted. He came to New Zealand and uh, he founded the Bible College that I was associated with. But I was a, a young fellow and I was pretty soft in texture. And uh, he was interested in discipling me. He was interested in helping to mold my character so that I would be able to be of more use to the Lord. And I, he used to, he didn't let me off with things. And I used to feel sometimes he was pretty tough. Uh, I used to get mad at him sometimes, but he was such a lovable fellow that I couldn't keep it up for long. His wife told me after he died, she said, you know, sometimes... My husband would come home and I'd see he was a little uneasy, he'd be a bit restless. And I said to him, well, what's the matter, what's the matter? And she said, he said to me, I wonder whether I've been too tough on him. <laughs> I wonder whether I've been a bit too, bit too tough on him. Well, perhaps he had, but what was he doing? He was trying to build strength into a, a part of my character which was weak. And that's what God was doing here with uh, Peter to make him a better and more useful servant in his kingdom. Peter had to learn to give unquestioning obedience to Christ and unquestioning discipleship, not worrying about how God was treating other people. The motive behind our service is of tremendous importance. The motive of our discipleship, why am I following the Lord? In verse 29 he says, for my sake. It's when we do it for his sake that the motivation is satisfactory. Now the same principle as I've been talking about is found in the parable of the laborers in Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 to 16. You remember how Jesus told the parable of the farmer who went out to the marketplace and there were the men waiting to be engaged. And so he went out at the beginning of the morning at six o'clock and he engaged a certain number and they agreed between them on the wages and they went to work. Then at the sixth hour, at twelve o'clock, he went out and there were still some there not engaged. So he engaged them and they went to work in his harvest field. And then at the eleventh hour, only an hour before closing time, he went and there were still some who'd never been engaged so he engaged them and they went away and they did only an hour's work because the day finished at six o'clock. But when he came to pay them he gave all the men exactly the same amount. The men who'd worked twelve hours got uh, one denarius and the one who'd worked six hours got a denarius and the one who'd worked only an hour got a denarius. And they, they said, why? They, the ways of the Lord are not just. The Lord, the, this farmer's not fair. Why? We've borne the burden and heat of the day. We've worked for 12 hours in a temperature of 35.8, the hottest day in 35 years. 
and we get only one denarius and these fellows who come in the cool of the evening five o'clock in the afternoon when the heat's down and you give them the same it's not fair and the Lord gave a very interesting answer he answered with two unanswerable propositions he said first of all I do you no wrong he said to the 12 hour workers he said I don't do you any wrong how much did we agree would be the wages and they said at one denarius well didn't I give you a denarius haven't I kept my part of the contract and the second thing he said was have I no right to be generous can't I do what I like with my own if I want to be generous, I'm not hurting anybody except myself. I'm the only one who suffers by it. Have I not the right to be generous? Now what was the point that our Lord was making? The point was this. He wasn't rewarding them for the number of hours that they had worked. He was rewarding them for the way in which they made use of the opportunity they were given. The men who weren't hired till six o'clock had only six hours to work and they worked faithfully. The ones who were hired at eleven o'clock had only one hour that they could work but they worked equally faithfully. And so the Lord gave an equal reward for equal faithfulness. Do you see the way in which the Lord's methods are illustrated in that parable? There are some people who've got tremendous capacity. And they can do a tremendous amount and achieve a great deal. There are some other people who've got very little capacity. And they can't achieve nearly so much. But the ones who have only got a little capacity, they can be just as faithful and use their little capacity 100%. And at the end, there is going to be an equal reward. The Lord has got his own way of evening things up. So, so oftentimes, too, we make a mistake. We think that other people are getting preferential treatment, that they're having a much better time than we are, but it's not always so. When David Livingstone, the great Indian uh, uh, African missionary, was in Britain after one of his very famous stints in Africa, and he was being lionized wherever he went, somebody came up to him and said, Oh, Dr. Livingston, it must be very wonderful to be so famous and have everybody talking about you. And Dr. Livingston very quietly said, Yes, but there is a kindly hand which behind the scenes applies the ballast when to all outward appearances we are sailing gloriously with the wind. What did he mean? David Livingston said he had a son who brought no joy to him. He was a soldier in the Confederate Army in America and he was bringing only sorrow to him. And while on the outside he seemed to be, Livingston seemed to be sailing gloriously with the wind and everything was going, run, run, going well, yet in his heart there was this secret sorrow. You know, we can't tell how God is dealing with other people. He'll, he'll be working with them. Behind many a smiling face there is an aching heart. But God has got his own way of preparing us for service. Have you ever thought of God's dealings with Joseph? For 13 years, God allowed everything to go wrong with Joseph. 13 years from the time in which he was let down into that pit until the time he became prime minister of Egypt. 
one thing after another. It looked as though it was going to work out all right, and then down he goes again. And then it looks as though things are improving, and down he goes again, until at last there he is, forgotten in an Egyptian prison. Until God's time arrives. And then all of a sudden, the butler has a, a memory a revival. And he remembers this man, and he tells Pharaoh, why, there's a man who can interpret dreams. And suddenly Joseph, after 13 years of nothing but disappointment, suddenly is brought before Pharaoh. And in a day, he becomes one of the most powerful men in the world. I ask you this, why did God allow him to go through all those experiences? Because otherwise, he would never have been able to be the prime minister of Egypt and God's representative in that country. You see, he was the father's spoiled boy. And if he'd stayed at home as a spoilt boy, the object of the hatred of his brothers, his character wouldn't have developed. But God allowed him to go through test after test. And Joseph proved himself every time. He was tested, first of all, by adversity. And how wonderfully he survived that. And then he was tested by allurement with Potiphar's wife and how wonderfully he came through that and then he was tested by advancement he's made the prime minister of Egypt and how wonderfully he was God's representative and saved the lives of millions of people but he would never have had the strength of character the texture that would enable him to withstand the, the jealous Egyptian officials if he had not gone through that hardening process. And God was doing this with Peter in order that he might be the man whom he could use. And on the day of Pentecost when you see this same Peter standing up and facing the rulers and the priests and so on, they, you are the ones who crucified the Lord of glory. Why, this is a different Peter. Something's happened. He'd learned his lessons.